All right, so first thing we should do is have a rest because my butt everyone's dying. I can't camp here. All right, we're in the middle of a town. We're supposed to go to like an inn to do that, right? What kind of place is this? Is it like a full-on dungeon? Or is it just a chamber? I'm supposed to pick a god that I want to be a follower of. That looks a little odd. It is just a chamber. Books? I like books. Huh. Shattered and charred stone blocks the passage into sun and shadow. That's what he did. He fucked it all up. Oh god. I give it to- Give them to you. How did some of them end up in your inventory? Hmm. Jesus. I take it these are the many, many books that explain who the gods are. And here's war paint. A lot of it. I forgot to drink back at the bar. That's my bed. Blood testament. Ooh. 2% raw damage per wound on a monk. Damn. Next time he's in the party. And the same braces of deflection we always find. Eh. We've read this before. This is the one that was everywhere. Once we were going through that, the Skane... The Skane temple. Because he's going to die for Skane. Manhood removed, nose and ears removed, useless eyes replaced by flint stones through which Skane might see the world. That was all distressing. Skane is distressing at times. This is, yeah, Wedeka, the Queen of Remembering. I've read that maybe twice, actually. Oh god, I really wish they were marked for which ones I've read. There's so many of these. Pretty sure, I recognize daily affirmations, I'm pretty sure. Yeah. There's a lot. The Sermon of Struggle. Midwife's Memoirs. I wish it was easy to remember these things. It's just this game is this game is so dense with these kinds of details. Oh, there's the interaction. It's in the middle of the room.
there's a lot going on here. Let's get everyone out of the way. Because it's just, there's too many things here. Okay. This one's nothing. Almost looks like the watcher icon or something. Rimmergun, Skane, Ondra, Barath, Hylia, Abaddon, Magran, Galloway. Uh. It doesn't seem like you can interact with these, but instead these stones. So they're bunched. You can choose Hylia or Barath. Or these three and these three. Curious. Hmm. Well, I've saved. I assume that I can learn about them without just committing to one. So let's try learning. This shrine sits before a bright constellation. Its stars forming the oval shape of an egg. A pair of wings sprout from the egg, stretched out to either side. Thirteen hundred. Gained experience instantly, which is kind of weird. What is this one for? Nothing happens when you approach Wetika Shrine. Ah. Who's this? A piercing ring fills your ears when you kneel where sh near Whale's Shrine. There is no other response. Hmm. So you're unresponsive and you're just generally obstinate. In the glittering stars of the nearby constellation, you see a grim shape of a skull. Its jaws are open wide as if frozen in a silent scream. Yet yeah, Barrett's not one of the happiest ones. Before the shrine sits the constellation of a snarling hound, fangs bared. Galloway, specifically Galloway, Abaddon and Magran are paired with them. Rimmergand. In the nearby constellation, you make out the shape of a strange horned beast. From time to time, you, you think you sense a faint chill emanating from the shrine itself. So it's Galloway, Rimmergand, Baroth, and Hylia. And they come with batches. Galloway. Let's, let's, let's try to pick up whatever we can about these people. When my students ask to be taught the way of Galloway, I tell them they have already failed. Does one ask a deer to present itself as dinner? Of course not. One must outwit, outmaneuver, and overpower the deer if one dreams of venison. So it is with the seeker god. To ask a question is weakness and idle indecision. To seek answers is to understand and to become one with Galloway. Survival begins with strength from within. Sounds like a pain. Asking questions is good. But I only strike my students when they ask the second stupid question, for all of us begin young and weak. It is a point of fact, and not one of shame, and a central tenet to Galloway's teachings. Perseverance and cleverness are prized by Galloway above brute force, a fact my young pups often forget. It is right and proper that the strong lead the weak, and it is equally proper that the strong be continually tested until the balance changes. Galloway celebrates the strength of the victor and the prowess of the well-fed predator, but above all, the clever hound celebrates the transformative nature of strength. Galloway's greatest desire for us is that prey becomes predator. Mewling babes grow into strong hunters, and the lost find their own enlightenment. This philosophy is best exemplified by the rites of the Anamfatha of Aya Glanfath. When one of the Glanfathan spiritual leaders is old and nearing death, it is customary to enter the woods and confront Galloway's herald. 
if the seeker god finds that Anamfath's life, deeds, and soul worthy. The reward is a quick death, and a soul joins Galloway's pack. If deemed unworthy, the Anamfath is killed, his soul forced to find its own way to the next life, and his memory erased from the records of the tribe. Survival begins with strength from within, and weak leaders endanger the whole pack. This is Galloway at his purest. Even at the end of life, one must struggle for worthiness, for greatness, just as one must struggle every day to feed his pack. The seeker god is easy to understand if one actively engages in the quest for knowledge, but his secrets are self occluding to those who might merely ask, desiring knowledge without the requisite hunt. My own flesh and blood once asked me, Will learning to hunt please, Galloway? I told him yes, but added, Galloway would prefer that you hunt to learn. Huh. Galloway and Stack. Who's the midwife? Hylia. Hylia is the midwife, it looks like. I like a god that is about the pursuit of knowledge, but I'm not psyched about the strong, the strong must lead the weak, and you will be punished eternally for not being strong enough. And all, and all those elements just seem kind of distressing. And the lack of community, lack of asking questions just seems counterproductive. The Midwife's Memoirs My mother lived every note of life's song. Bring me into this world was her last verse. For this, my father scorned me and, abhorred, and abandoned me, and for this very same fact my town's midwife and adherent of Hylia raised me as her own. When I came of age, I learned that Hylia visits us on the screams of women in childbirth, and when a woman dies giving birth to her child, her soul is carried away and reborn as an avian attendant in Hylia's court. Though the miracle of the Queen of Birds, my mother has been with me, watching over me my whole life. I wear the fetish charms of the cloud singer, the bird I dreamt my mother became. My feathery trinkets look gaudy and unbecoming, but it is a signal fire to women in need that I am a trained mid midwife, blessed by Hylia, and living every note of, si of life's song. The queen of birds wills us to shepherd new life into the world, and not, as other gods so often desire, to end it. A follower of Magran, once mocked my faith, saying I worshipped paintbrushes and birds, piddling things beneath the gods. I do not resent the other gods and the brutal necessities that they must oversee. But is not language, love, arts, and creativity that which separates us from simple beasts? Highly allows us to rise above our savage, feral selves. I'm often amused that, upon seeing our holy aviaries, Visitors frequently ask, This is nice, but where's the real tem Temple of Hylia? Perhaps they think hallowed ground requires oppressive stoneworks and ceilings that hide the sky. They do not realize the Bird Queen stands not on ceremony. She makes herself manifest in the music of birds and in the beauty of the ubiquitous open sky. Hylia prefers the worship of two children singing over a thousand petitioners silently praying for victory. The Sky Mother asks so little of us, and yet so much. We are charged to live every note of life's song. It surprises me how many fail to embrace this divine calling. I've definitely read that before. And I think I immediately, I think I, think I even said afterwards that's just inherently an appealing character compared to some of the other ones that are given here. The Sermon of Struggle, for example. Magran. Even when our war banners, banners sit idle. I don't know why I picked that, skipped that far. <laughs> Excerpts from the Sermon of Struggle. Choice is a luxury we earn through peace. Struggle is our fundamental nature. Even when our war banners sit idle, mankind forments strife. Friends argue with fists. Lovers kindle jealousies. Merchants compete with lies. Wherever mankind goes, struggle follows. Magran is goddess of fire and war, not bloodshed and conquest. 
though many in Ratsaras would tell it differently. How bitter they must be that Magran's priests were able to destroy a god made manifest. How bitter indeed. We who worship Magran are not addled barbarians or cloistered mystics. We are soldiers, armorers, watchmen, and bodyguards. Artisans of conflict and protectors of our families and flags. We do not salivate for battle. We view war as unwelcome, but struggle is our fundamental nature. We do not pray for strife. We pray for the wisdom to resolve it quickly. We do not wish for a war, but when the inevitability must be fought, we find divine ecstasy in discipline, efficacy, uh, efficiency, and excellence. Magran, guide us to the battle that is just and fair. Let us be your fire that burns away the profane, leaving only the righteous. If struggle is our fundamental nature, let victory be our inevitable state of grace. And Magran's with Galloway. They're definitely the struggle sects. Maybe I shouldn't have put that couple of books away. I had so many copies of this one at this point. Did any one of them come out? That was weird. They're down there. Rumorgan Andra Skane. So Skane, let's put him up here with Rimmergand when I find who he is. This is the sacrifice. He wasn't supposed to speak about his plotting, about what was going to happen. I have volunteered to be the, eff the effigy. Skane will inhabit my body using my oh, his, this old farmer's simple flesh as a puppet for godly rage. I have been shaved and anointed. Curse my name if you must, but never weep for me. I die for the betterment of our community. Because he's the god of slaves. The quiet slave. Tomorrow my master chokes on his own whip. It's essentially a god of revenge. Violent revenge. This is Abaddon. All errors can be reforged into lessons. Abaddon's the guy who built himself. Like he has an artificial body that he built on his own. So once again, a struggle god. Every, your very being being created from your own craft and struggle. We've definitely read that one before because I have a bunch of copies of it. Missives of the Hand Occult. Whale. The character, the one that won't talk to us. Dearest brother, or was it sister? May this letter find you in well spirits. A man of thuggish bearing stormed into my library the other day and demanded I help him find a book on the construction of an arquebus. I thought it proper service to Whale to steer this man toward an illuminated manuscript on the subject of whittling toy soldiers and other miniature props. Unamused by my solution, I shrugged and said, What is an answer without a question? He did not find my spiritual rhetoric helpful or amusing. And so he punched out two of my teeth. I trust your summer has been less tumultuous than mine. In more important news, my apprentice, my apprentice claims she saw the eyeless face in a dream the other night. I admit I was so mad with envy that at first I refused to believe her. While forgive me for such a lapse of judgment. She described... An Amawa of brilliant blue hues, with featureless face, surrounded by a swarm of eyes. No two eyes alike. She claims while sh I, I think it was while or whale. I, I'm just going to stick with whale. I can't get over it. She claims whale ignored her questions, and she can't recall any specifics of what she of what was said. In fact, my apprentice seems to have forgotten many things since that since before that visitation. She could not tell me where she grew up or what she liked to eat. At first I was so envious of her for having seen Whale for her own, with her own eyes, but it seems Whale's visit was to conceal, not to illuminate. Yeah, I've definitely read this before. I pray she endures this test of faith and can look back on the events and feel the joy of mystery. Of mystery. Yeah. So this is about how he's just so stubborn and obtuse. And that's inherently what he does. 
So of course I can't pray to them as an option because they're <clears throat> actively useless. It's their goal. Barath. We found our fourth category. I think he's a naughty one, isn't he? The many faces of Barath. How fitting that we know the god of cycles, doorways, mortality, and inevitability as Barath. While the Valians know this very same god as Sirongo, for, if nothing else, Barath teaches us that duality exists in all things. There is life and death, and death and life. Embrace this duality, and you honor Barath. In the ruins of Ayar Glanfath, Barath is depicted in the form of two semi-skeletal figures, one male, one female. Yep, here's the did life and death, death and life. So it's about the duality of life and death, we've read this one before for sure. It is said that Barath has the most petitions of any god. Who has not prayed? Who has not prayed for the cycle to hiccup? So they're breaker of cycles. No, it's what people. It's because they're the inevitability of cycles. So people pray for uh, reprieve. Barath may not rescue our loved ones, but it answers our prayers in its own divine way. Barath is a god that makes life end in death, and is also the god that makes death end in life. Yep. It's the god of the cycle. The god of the wheel, basically. Rimmergond? It's time for Rimmergond. Found him. Rimmergond is paired with Skein. Who's up here? The Enigmatic God of Cold. Young students are often confused by Barath and Rimmergon's seemingly overlapping roles in holding dominion over death. Barath oversees the cycle of life, death, and rebirth. Rimmergon oversees the cold, destructive act of death itself. This difference is often difficult for novices to appreciate until they've lost a loved one and endured the absence for a time. It is Barath that determines we will be reborn, just as certainly as we will die. But Rimmergand is the executioner's axe. Rimmergand shows us that all life ends in stillness. I need only show them the symbol of Rimmergand, the bone-white Oruk's skull found carved within the most ancient of Ingwithin ruins. It is a symbol of death and doom in every culture. Any child with four winters under his belt needs no introduction to the ancient symbol. Rimmergand embodies not just death, but all manifestations of collapse, be they famine, plague, or simple bad luck. Rimmergand is a primal god, silent and inscrutable as death itself. He makes himself known with his passing, not by proclamation. There are innumerable stories of the god's terrifying passage through the lands of Eora, with the beast of winter stirred. Uh, when the beast of winter stirs, bitter winds and beastly howling follow the creature's every move. Wherever the beast plants a hoof, all life withers to dust. The faithful of Rimmergand insist that even another's god's life can end in stillness. They claim the other gods must flee from the beast of winter's mastery over death. But we know not if this boast holds true. Though the beast of winter is shrouded in snowy clouds, those who have seen the shaggy white monster claim that the souls of the fallen can be seen clinging, or perhaps frozen, to the beast's fur. The dwarves of the Boreal South have numerous stories that tell of a similar plot. A brash hero seeks out the beast of winter to rescue the souls trapped in its fur. These tales never end well, for even if the hero saves his beloved soul, the hero dies in the process. For it is not a proper tale of Rimmergand unless the hero's life ends in stillness. Interesting. One of the first stories we read of a, of somebody dying in in the uh, in the white was of a terrifying creature that was always kind of on their trail, and we, we couldn't tell if they were hallucinating the creature or if the creature was like kind of trapping them and making them get lost in the in the in the 
in the blizzard and kind of tr dooming them and then be, be potentially preying on them when they're vulnerable. But it might have been the Beast of Winter. Which still doesn't tell us whether it's a hallucination or not, because they could have been seeing this Beast of Winter for real and it was just shepherding them to death. Or their belief in such a creature might have been leading to their hallucination of such a concept in a moment like that. But we have more context for that story, I think. Who's this? Andra. Andra's pa paired with... Ah, Rimmergun Skane and Andra. Okay. There's an area called Andra's Gift, wasn't there? Yeah. Selected correspondence of Giftbringer Aiden. Sing, O oh ocean waves, of Andra's sorrow. Of her unrequited love for the unattained, unattainable moon. Sing of the ocean's sorrow so that we may forget our own. Each day the tides reenact Andra's longing for the great moon. The waters reach out at high tide, yearning for the heavenly body, only to slump into low tide when the moon proves unattainable. You ask me once why I loved Andra so dearly, how I could go from a life on dry land to being a devotee of the goddess of the oceans. I sing of the ocean's sorrow so that I may forget my own. It is Andra's message that speaks to my heart. I have devoted my life to helping others discard painful memories. Right, because Andra's the one that... Uh, yes, right. It probably seems dumb that I'm having realizations about things we've encountered several times before, but like, there's just so many, there's so much lore in this game, so many cultures and people, and you kind of just go driving past them all. So this is the gift bearer faction, the people that take items from grieving people and discard them and hide them. We, we've, we've dealt with them plenty. I've devoted my life to helping others discard painful memories, for that is the gift Andre gave me. When I lost my young daughter, my wife and I were inconsolable until a gift bearer offered to take my toddler's toys and cast them into the deepest waters. Yeah, we've definitely encountered this before. I believe we've read that entire thing too, but we have some context. Who do we have here? Saint Wadwin, who is dead. Or at least unresponsive. Yeah. The 3311. 331. Yep, that's all of them. Might as well, though. Until I recognize that it's someone when we read before, at least. Ten years at dawn. Of dawn. Ten years I tilled the vorless leaf, and ten years I told myself that living in St. Wadwin's footsteps would bring me rebirth. Each day I'd pray that if thou art in darkness, he shall bring thee light. And yet, and each yet. And each yet each night. Now do I remember the uh, fact that this is, if I remember correctly, this is like a spiteful, frustrated person praying to a god that doesn't seem to re react. But uh, on top of that, it's uh, I remember that typo because it's supposed to be and yet each night, but it's a, and each yet each night. It's called Wadwin's Legacy. But that's Wetica, not Wadwin. Right. But is that tied to Wetica? I've... Or is it... It's Eothis. The Eothasians. There's a lot of gods to keep straight. Yeah, we've been through this, though. He's very frustrated at the lack of response from Wadwin. Did I read any of these just now? Oh, Giftbringer Iden. I, maybe I hadn't read it before. I think I have, though. I don't know. There's only one paragraph left anyway. Truth be told, I and the other gift bearers I know have never, never even spoken to Andra. She is largely silent, and when she does speak, she uses floods and tidal waves instead of words. But we sing of the ocean's sorrow so that others may forget theirs. Andra's story, the story of, of desire unanswered, actually matters to people like you and me. Magran cannot steer you to victory over sadness. Hylia cannot force joy down a crying throat. Only Andra can give you the strength to persevere 
when it life seems w without worth, and that is the answer to your question regarding why I love my goddess so dearly. Skein. Burn. Feel thy hatred twist within thee. Feed thyself on its bile. Sustain thyself on its anger. This hatred, this bile, this anger, shall these shall be the tools for thy rebellion. Let thine heart seethe. There is no satisfaction in open confrontation. Hide thine hatred. Let it grow, that it may fester. Make thy plots in secret. The quiet slave stays in the shadows. His face seeks not the light. In darkness doth he work. In darkness doth he move. Rebel against those that seek to control thee. Rebel against those that wish to remove thee. You guys are brutal. So, yeah. So these three are focused on loss. This one's focused on cycles. This one's focused on birth. And these ones are focused on struggle and conflict and growth. I think I'm kind of being able to summarize these. Because Rimmergond is essentially the Reaper, but not like Baroth, that's like the proper cycle maintainer, but more like just the sake destruction for the sake of it. Maybe even taking joy in such things. Skane is about revenge and the downtrodden. It's the person it's what it's the it's the god the hopeless pay uh, tribute to for violent retribution, whereas Andra is the calmer of the three, one more focused on forgetting, and moving on. They're kind of they're kind of three different elements of loss, and pain, and these are two polar opposite reactions to said loss, more or less. Whereas these are actually relatively similar, these three. They're all about struggle and growth and working for every gain. Although not on the level, quite on the level of Whale, who won't even fucking talk to us. Uh, Baroth is pretty straightforward as being the life-death cycle and highly is about being birth. If there's two people I'd like to pray to to fix the current problem of Wadwin's legacy, it'd be these two, I would say. So they're both about fixing the cycle in some way. Hylia would be interested in stopping the Hollowborn, specifically, and Baroth would just be interested in making sure that the cycle, that the souls are going back on the wheel and, and cycling the way they're supposed to, instead of, you know, vanishing and being used up in, in machines and splitting and going into strange creatures or jumping from body to body or being preserved in undead and all these other things are going wrong. So they both both of these are specifically have a vested interest in ending the Hollowborn. While also not being as reprehensible as some of some of the other ones are. Highly is pretty appealing for a number of reasons. Whereas Bareth is not really appealing at all, but just kind of the inevitability of it all. There's just an honesty to Bareth. All right, I've quit. I've saved. So let's let's see what this interaction actually does. You step before the shrine and prepare to recite the ritual words. Fuck. Oh, live every note of life's song. Your words seemed to ring in the air, your voice rendered melodic and lit lilting by some unseen art. I do, I do, I appreciate that this is like, it's like a reckoning, it's like, you get to this part of the game, it's like, no, you're going to, you're going to start understanding the lore, goddammit. We're going to sit here and we're going to get, read a bunch of fucking Bible texts and you're going to be able to pick out the correct line that resonates with the god you choose and so on. You're both going to figure out the hard way which one you want to interact with, and also you're going to prove that you know what you're talking about. That's like a- that's a nice little test. You shut your eyes to pray. As you wait in darkness, the world around you changes. You feel sunlight, bright and warm on your face. A light breeze carries music to your ears. As vivid as these sensations feel, you somehow know that they are not real. 
You look around and find yourself standing in an open-air temple built on a mountain summit. It's filled with elves, orlans, and assorted other kith. Ringing the entire scene is a fringe of trees, their verdant branches filled with birds of all different colors, shapes, and sizes. Halogenia takes it all in with, a, with squinting eyes and a wry smile. And I'm supposed to feel at home here, really. I'm surprised they can see this, honestly. Everyone is singularly absorbed in a particular pursuit, and Orlin sits with a canvas, a paintbrush in his hand, and jars of green, blue, and yellow pigments at his feet. An elf and an Amawa, standing to the side, are locked in conversation, their expressions dancing with delight. Still others scribble stanzas of poetry or crude sketches on sheafs of paper, losing themselves in the delicate minutiae of lines and syllables. You feel the breeze again, and two elves basking in the sunlight shiver. The largest group gathers in the middle of the temple. They sing a lush, chaotic harmony, composed of several complementary melodies. Others drift towards the, si the singers in ones and twos, as if buffeted by a gust of wind or a phrase of the song. A ripple passes through the trees. You think it's the wind, but the chirping changes to screeching. Hundreds of birds take to the skies, all headed in one direction. Away. Heravius admits a series of chirping bird calls as the flock scrambles into the air. This is bad. Heravius mutters, his face turning sour. Something has them spooked, but they won't tell me what. Then again, I think I mispronounced my bird song and probably called them incontinent. The devotees glance at the trees, just barely distracted from their activities. But the wind picks up, scattering their pages of poetry and art and ripping the songs from their lips. They look skyward and you follow their gaze. A dark shape blots out the sun. You can't tell what it is, but as it unfolds and expands, it seems to fill the sky. The wind roars over the summit. That explains the birds. Before you can flee, a shadow falls over the temple. It begins as a stain in the corner and spreads, blotting out the flagstones. It reaches the nearest kith, a black-furred orlin. The darkness swallows her, leaving only a puff of smoke in her place. The two elves that you saw earlier, a man and a woman, flee. You get a brief image of them huddled in the shadow of a mountain. They seem to see you, too, and they reach out, calling silently after you. The others, however, seem frozen. As the shadow advances, they likewise vanish, one by one. The driving gale scatters their ashes and the charred remains of their creations. The grieving mother holds their hand, holds her hand. Songs of joy turn to screams of agony. What purpose, what lesson could possibly lie behind such destruction? You look up again at the source of the shadow. But the eclipsed sun forms a blinding corona around the thing. You can't make out any details. You can, however, feel heat. Restore my temple. You look down and find yourself standing next to Hylia's shrine, in Tierra Evron. Your pulse still races, and your skin is damp with sweat from your strange encounter. Travel to Hylia's temple. That was a bad time. In the mountains above Twin Elms, something sinister haunts Hylia's temple. I've been asked to confront this terror and putting an end to it. In the goddess's vision, I saw her followers terrorized and struck down by a terrible menace. Presumably, removing that threat will earn me her favor. The vision showed me a male and female elf who fled the mountaintop. Last I saw, they were hiding in a ring of stones. The ruin of an older temple in Twin Elms. There's a if there's a district of the city with other temples, I may be able to find the elves there. 
They could show me the way to Hylia's temple. Hmm. I believe we made our choice. Put a lot of books away now. <laughs> there we go. Uh, I think we might be getting late into the story here. Getting the support of a god and hunting him down in a pit of sacrifice. Finishing every single character's companion quest is kind of coming up at this point. I definitely wonder. So there was an immediacy to the idea of coming here and going for him, but it seems like he's doing some great long path and I have a shortcut. But it involves jumping into a pit. Can't help but wonder if you can get back out at that point. I'm kind of taking this as a potential warning. This is my this might be my last chance to do my final tour where I go around and wrap up everything that we haven't finished yet, including the other expansion. Huh. At the very least the immediacy is somewhat gone. I thought I was chasing him into a temple, but for all I know he's headed towards our final confrontation location or something. Now that we have the context of what's going to mean to get to him, and also the fact that I have to go on, like, a big quest to gain the favor of a god just to gain access to following them, that's, a uh, That's not an immediate quest. It's not ex we're not exactly on Vermeer right now, and shit's going down and I need to get to the end of it, and it'd be weird to go on detours. This is more like, no, you have to... go on... your own expedition at this point, even in the main story. So I think I'll I think I'll approach it that way. I gotta remember to go to that bar and drink. Yeah. Let's deal with that now. Not just because I can drink there, but because my character is maimed. And that's a bad time. I got all fucked up by traps when I was stealing, which is a thing that I uh do. <laughs> uh I'm really bad about that. No matter what kind of character I'm playing, I find my way just kind of grabbing everything. It's hard to break the habit because it's kind of how games are inherently played. It's way easier to be more conscious of whether or not stealing. Hmm. Pardon me, madam. I didn't see you there. My whole right side is sort of a blind spot. Interesting. It's her weird perception aura. He didn't see her as being anyone besides a random person he bumped into. And then, even at the end, even his attempts to explain himself or even say anything about the situation, he mostly just gives up on, and now he's probably already forgotten that that whole encounter happened. Or that seems to be the case. B booze Ooh, that was the last one. And now we're done. Also, all soulbound upgrades are completed. Yeah. So what's the grand total here? Because this is a lot for a hat. Once per... Once per encounter when I'm crit, I confuse the opponent. I'm immune to being confused or dazed. I have three resolve, two dexterity, and two constitution. And I'm immune to charmed and dominated. Fuck. That's a lot going on there. That is not bad. Wow. Resolve, dexterity, and constitution. I want to make sure I don't have any things that increase my resolve, dexterity, or constitution, because they're all kind of accounted for in one location at the moment. <laughs> There's one resolve here, but I, I wear it for the two intellect. It's called unwavering resolve, but funnily enough, it primarily upgrades the other stat. Perception is not upgraded, though. Yeah. It seems like a dense number of things, but there are six stats, so this is only do dealing with three of them. Still, though, not bad. 
These pirate items are clearly powerful. She also has plus three to different stats. Or plus two or three different stats. I think I got this from the same vendor. This is also finished, so we're, we're making good progress with these. And I think this came from the same vendor. And it's also finished, so we've... We're doing well. Things are going well. Wow. One resolve and one survival, or ba-bam! Two might. Two constitution, two resolve. Big stats. But it goes away when you rest once. As opposed to twice. Good shit, though. We gotta go- we gotta go deal with Roderick and a few other things. But my priority here was just to heal our friend. And now, I need to start looking into the... The Warriors building or whatever it was called? I think it's the last location I need to check in the Sands area. Yeah, Heravius wants to go to the Burial Isle, which I believe is not currently a location, or not currently a choice, but eventually. Yeah, my, my, I've gotten way better at this. I've only lost 200 to Bandits this time, earning over a thousand. They might even pay for the freaking... It doesn't show the wages anywhere on here because these are only turns, huh? It might even give competition, though, to the amount I have to pay for wages. Some kind of equilibrium. A very reading heavy episode. If I find that last book, I might read that entire Deerwood chronology in one in one sitting. Just because it's been waiting for so long to happen. Who have we not satisfied yet? You still have a quest in progress. In this location specifically. And so do you, but in the area we need to, yeah, we need to gain access to those locations. Yours is vague, and I'm not sure what to do with you. And Palagina's, I think, might have ended? It's either it's over or we have to go back to the Defiance Bay. Whereas I think Edair's is done. I think most of the people that aren't here right now are also done, except for Durance, who is also vague. Oh, here's the guy. Here's the braggart. And that's when I pierced the giant's tail, Gar, with my spear, right through the heart. Oh, Arthur, when I wish I could have seen you do it. A lanky hunter grooms his stubble, a patched fuzz of blonde hairs, while listening attentively to a young elven woman. She whispers in his, red in in his reddened ears and giggles. With his head still lowered, he flashes a wide smile in return. The hunter notices you. He clears his throat and straightens his back, adopting an air of dignity. I have been expecting you. My tribesmen have told me that you're here to speak the truth about Fiorm's exile. He combs his sparse stubble, darting a glance to the elven woman. Well, Arthwin doesn't hide from the, tu the truth, ask and I'll answer. Tell me about your tribe. We're young. The youngest tribe in our Glanfath. Arthwin hesitates for a moment, scratching his beard, then spreads his long legs apart. But we're not weak. The other tribes have their history, and now we, the twice-split arrows, are making our own. Arthwin puffs his chest and pounds it with a fist. We're true Glenfathans, true hunters. I've proven our worth. His patches of gold and stubble sparkle alongside a glowing smile. It was me, not Fjorm. Who killed the giant Stelgar? What happened to Fjorm? Arthur looks down and licks his lips. Fjorm. 
He pushes the blonde bristle, bristles away from the edge of his mouth. Every tribe knows his prowess, a hunter of great name, but this time he fell behind. We spotted the giant Stalgar in the Sentinel's Ridge, above the, above the waterfall of the northern Northweald. It was stalking for prey. Arthwin lightly shakes his head. Fjorm wanted us to split. He lured the beast to the river, and I'd flank it. The hunter scratched his flushed earlobe. A lot of r rubbing and scratching everywhere in the story. But the beast didn't come down to the riverbank, so we tried to circle it on the ridge. I climbed faster, and there, I was, there it was ready to pounce on me. Arthwin thrusts his fist forward. I pierced flesh, midair, rolled over and stabbed at it again and again. And it was dead. The hunter pushes his mustache back and looks up. Fuom couldn't believe he didn't earn the kill. Not even a cut. He said he'd not return with the shame of losing to a twice-split arrow. Arthwin sighs. I pleaded. But he was a keeper of the stone. He'd not listen. And now he's exiled. Who knows where. Goodbye. Hmm. Later, you can show us how you used your big spear. Oh, well, yes, I can do that. Oh, boy. I'm suspicious. But maybe that guy just was a loser and he just took off. Because he was because his pride was hurt. Seems silly though. I don't know if I've gotten the full context though for what the blood feud was or the blood the blood hunt I think it was called. Like what that means for them is it just a competition? Because if it's just a competition that seems petty and unreasonable to uh, for a life change, but it could be something more significant than that. Like it was meant to resolve something. There's a lot of three tusks here. A lot of three tusks are here. First blade warrior s first blade wilder woman. Leaders like Simok have long protected us from the Estramorn. The hearth still smells of freshly cooked game. Grease spatters the blackened bricks. It's kind of cool. There's just a bunch of Stalgar all over the place. Just everywhere in this town. Makes me nervous, though. Why won't it let me read this one? I don't know. There's been a few... Oh, there we go. The crates contain a few necessities of Glenfathen traveling party. Furs and blankets, sturdy hide clothing, and gifts of carved Adra. They just can kind of wander in. That's probably a leader here. Yep, Simok. Come to treat with the three tusk Stalgar. Though simple and unadorned, the blades are made of sharp and finely tempered steel. A grizzled old elf, his hair braided and dyed, stands on one end of the hall. His arms and chest are cross-hatched with the pale seams of scars. His crooked smile looks like another. It's not many, Estramorn, who are permitted into our sacred city. Bethwill must be feeling especially soft today. Eder pays no attention to the elf, and instead, instead has locked eyes with the stale guard in front of him. He whispers to you, You think you'd mind if I pet his stale guard? Sagani lowers her head. Remember how well that worked out last time? Oh my god, call back to random dialogue that plays when you're walking around. Come to hear your come to hear your future at Tyr Evron. His smile widens, exposing a row of yellowed crooked teeth. Or to make your own at Blood Sands. What's Blood Sands? An ancient place of sacrifice. He laces his fingers together. 
in a cave by the great elms themselves. Rayston and his druids have been an integral part of Glatfathan's society for generations. No matter what some of the other tribes might say, Ayr Glanfoth has held its own against the Estramorn because some of us still understand the power of sacrifice. How many times has, like, has this been said in this game? I wonder, I want to do, like, a, a whole control F on the whole script. Because <laughs> that, that's a very common expression that shows up in these games, in this game. It gives you an appraising eye. Does the thought make you uncomfortable? It should. It's what's kept our society alive for so long. Simak crosses his arms over his scarred chest. Something else? You don't seem fond of us, Estramorn. His hunched shoulders straighten. I fought in the Broken Stone War, and the War of Black Trees. I saw my brethren cut down defending the places of the Builders, and I shed blood alongside Galvin Regged himself. He coughs. Now, the Estamorn seem to think that they will find a cure for their empty children among our sacred sites. Or worse, that they will find sanctuary in our lands. His gaze darkens. And I've seen what happens when they set their sights on Glenfathen's soil. Well, he does have a point, Heravius mutters under his breath. You learn not to trust your neighbors when they defile your lands, habitually, for several generations. Heravius folds his arms and shrugs. He's got all the reason in AR to worry. Have pity. They're only trying to save their children. And when the Estramorn invade us in force and bring their plague here, what of our children? In my 250 years, I've led people through two wars. Our borders have remained intact, and largely through the reputation of the Three Tusk Stalgar. His voice drops to a growl. I've sired a dozen children, but none have been deemed fit to take my place. I care nothing for the legacies that obsess the Estramorn lords but it is important that my successor continue this path. If your own children don't succeed you, what happens? Ordinarily, the Riau would turn to others in my tribe, to clan heads and their families. Ordinarily, he levels his gaze. But we share a tradition of fostering the children of other tribes, and the Anamfath, a fisher crane, has trusted his youngest to my care. He grimaces. And as none of my own blood are fit to take my place, the Riau will look next to this bog child, the kin of another Anamfath, and my foster daughter, to take my place. You should be so lucky, Heravius chirps. This young fisher crane lass is a great gift. You should be thankful. Heravius' voice becomes a low whisper, especially given your uh, familial feebleness. Bog child. His shoulders stiffen. I have nothing but respect for Fisher Crane, but their ways are not ours. The Orlands of Fisher Crane have lived in Thane Bog for a thousand years. They are cunning and furtive by nature, which serves them well when they have swamp lands to hide their movements. He crosses his arms. But this will not deter the Estramorn in open ground. I think you underestimate what a few stealthy archers can do. He points at the warriors gathered near the fire. Our savagery has deterred the Estramorn from further encroachment. They still tell of our deeds in the Broken Stone War. But if a child of Fisher Crane leads our tribe, we will lose that boldness, and the Estramorn will lose their fear of us. The child will be influenced by the souls of her ancestors. In times of crisis, she will look to her kin in Thean Bog for guidance. No matter what I might try to teach her, it will not be enough. Well, how young is she? I feel like you can change anyone's ways if they're young enough. Because they just, you become their life. 
Unless it's just the matter the power of souls of previous generations, except the fact that like souls can hop all over the place into completely different societies, as shown by Sagani's problems. He considers you. There is a way you could help. Few have the stomach for it, but I think you have the perspective to see why certain unpleasantness may be necessary. Are you telling me to kill the kid? Because it doesn't leave you with a, an heir either anyway. Say nothing. The Olin girl has the soul of a leader. If it were passed to one of my own offspring, our tribe would remain strong. Jesus. A stalegar at Simok's side scratches its massive head on the Anamfat's leg. He remains steady on his feet. The druids of Bloodsands have a way to do this. And they understand the importance of a strong line of succession for three tusk Stalgar. The irises on Palagina's golden eyes grow wide. This is brutal talk, even among Glanfathans. He gives you a key. There's a house in southeast Hearthsong, next to the river. The child will be asleep, and I've arranged for her to be unattended for a time. His voice becomes a quiet rumble. Take her. And bring her to the keeper, Weirda. Weirda, in, Bro in Blood Sands. She knows what must be done. When she presents you with the liquid essence, bring it back to me. Wow, we went from z really went from zero to a hundred. Why is he? Why is he trusting me? This is like a, a weird gamble of like a brutal thing. I get the feeling this isn't normal around here. I don't see why you need me to do this. Because I cannot do it without attracting undue attention, he frowns. I don't relish passing my own burdens onto another. But this will incite war between our tribes if I am caught. The Orland child? Oh. Tell me about the potion you need from, from Werda. Essence bound and distilled into liquid. It will have little immediate effect on me, but it will weave a stronger soul in my furti- my future tissue. In my future issue? Is issue... Isn't it... Isn't that... Aren't we talking about semen? <laughs> what will keep it worth to do with this child? His scarred face twists again. Have you seen the rituals of blood sands? She will sacrifice her is the only way to distill her essence. Heravia stares at Simok wide-eyed. What a loathsome wretch, even by three tusk standards. How about I pummel this unhinged old man until I'm picking bits of bones, brain, and essence out of, hit, out of my fur? Tempting. How can you possibly expect to get away with this? You know the girl is here. And one Orlin babe will look much the same as the next. She sh he, Jesus. Now we're getting racist about Orlins on top of everything else. He shrugs. But let me worry about this. I won't do this. I do not relish the deed. But two centuries of leadership have taught me that all things bear a cost. He nods once. Consider it well, Esther Moore. I am not above rewarding those who are of service. Tell me about the Three Tusk Stalgar. The boldest and fiercest of the six great tribes of Ioglanfath. It was me we who first defended against the Esther Morn who came to shore two hundred years ago. He raises his chin. We have always been the, bro the border tribe and it has always fallen to us to hold the line against outsiders and invaders. Heravius leans in with a whisp whispered voice. The way they keep mentioning the battles of old, you think the Three Tusk Martyr... The, you would think that the, th the Three Tusk Martyr tribe... They are indeed fierce, and their history is rife with glorious deeds. I sometimes think they'd fight the other tribes if they didn't have trespassers to hunt. What do you do here? As Adam Foth of Three Tusk Stalgar, I guide our tribe in all matters. He looks to the main room of the hut, where others have gathered. 
I am in Twin Elms to confer with some of the other Anamfatha about Onolfen, your hollowborn. We only have such births here on occasion, but it has made us more vigilant about our neighbors. Once Delgar stretches, flex flexing its claws, Simuk's eyes narrow. There are some of us who believe your on Onolfen to be punishment for the defilement of the builder's uh, sites. Others say it's a plague carried by the Estramorn. It's kind of between the two of those. It's not an actual plague, but it's artificial evil devices, but that is from the it is from those sites. So yeah. Except it's not punishment, it's on purpose, because someone's an asshole. All answers to fit their hatred. There's no reason to believe a word of it is true. Goodbye. Wow, dude. Shit's fucked up. Uh. 